Blog Talk Radio. Mi chiamo Akura Kanu Akurai Kainu. Ne ye akan po nana son da. Me dinde ujira po kwesi rane mpita akan. Akwamu mai na marukai titi mu ujira po. Ujira mai mu. Greetings to all Akurakani Akurai Kaidu people, many Africans like people today is Akan po nana son de ancient authentic Akan ancestral religion day. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Ranehm Vata Akan. Ojirapo of the Akwamu Nation in North America within Ojirama, the purified nation, Akurakani, Akuraikaiti people in the Western Hemisphere. Yet I say we thank you once again for tuning in to the broadcast. We are going to open up the chat room. If you have any questions or comments and you're on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. If you have any questions or comments, you'd like to interact in the chat room, log in as a user to interact in the chat room. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one. So, uh, for those who are new to the broadcast, we have three broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanpo Nanasom, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion, on Monday night, dealing specifically with the Akan expression of ancestral religion on uh, Benada, Abenada Tuesday nights we have Ojira, which means purification, where we deal with ancestral religion in general, not just the Akan expression, but in general, and how it impacts every aspect of our lives. And then on uh, Wednesday nights, Awukuda, Akoda, we have Egua Marketplace, where we deal specifically with Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions who are serving the community in a positive capacity, and those, of course, who have maintained their ancestral religious value in the context of their service and how that informs their service to the community. We have published the Okong Economic Development Model, which is an economic development model rooted in ancestral religious value. You can download that publication for our, from our Okong Economic Development Model page on our website. and. Part of that process is the strategy we use to starve the beast and feed the prize. That means we make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds we would have potentially wasted with the whites in our offspring, and then we starve the beast and feed the prize. We reallocate those funds from the white businesses to the business organization or institution of the week. We are targeting one Afurakani Afurakani business organization or institution per week for 52 weeks for optimal capital infusion. Therefore, when we starve the beast and feed the pride, you take the 10 or $15 you would have wasted at Walmart or, or Burger King, wherever you would have gone, 7-Eleven, and you transfer those funds to the business of the week, infusion of 10 or $15. When a thousand of our people engage that process, that's an infusion of ten to $15,000 into the coffers of a black business so they can maintain their business expand their services to us, hire people within the community immediately, and perpetuate their employment, serve us at a greater capacity. If we do not engage that process of starving the beast and feeding the prize, then by default, we are leaving that ten or $15,000 in the hands of our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring, and serving them, serving their families, and by default, we are financing our own oppression. So we engage this process on a consistent basis, you see the list of the businesses, organizations, and institutions which is growing on our Okong Economic Development Model page. And we'll put that link in the chat room right now. And you can see the link to their, their, their website. You'll also see the link to their uh, interviews that they did with us on the Egua Marketplace show where they sat with us for two hours and talked about their businesses, organizations, institutions, their philosophy behind serving the community and so forth. So all of that information is on the page. We also have coming up a couple of announcements. We have coming up our Echi Sign, Afurakani, Afurakani African Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference, March 20th here in Washington, D.C. It is an all-day conference from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. It is free and open to Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people, only, and there is registration. The registration is free, but you must register 
to attend the conference, you can go to our page, our ST sign page on our website. We'll put that link in the chat room right now. If you're on the phone line, ST sign, well, you go to the OGRAFO page, O D W I R A F is in free, O dot com. The ST sign page is A K Y I S A N, and you'll see the information there. We're talking about ancestral religious reversion. We don't deal with conversion, which means that you're converting someone into something, which is pseudo-religion. You only have to convert somebody into something when you have a fake religion with fake cartoon characters like Jesus, Muhammad, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, all of these fictional cartoon characters. You only have to convert someone into something when it's false. When you have a real religion, you don't engage in conversion. We embrace and affect reversion. We're reverting back or returning to our original pristine state, our ancestrally inherited tradition. Our approach to aligning our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order rooted in our ancestors, born of the blood circles of our people and carried in our bones and blood wherever we migrated on earth or wherever we were forced to migrate on earth, including the Western Hemisphere. We were forced into the Western Hemisphere during the Musuo Ketye, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era, those who maintained their ancestral religious practices are those who were empowered and guided to wage war against the whites and their offspring, massacre the whites and their offspring, and force an end to enslavement in the Western Hemisphere, including in North America. So we will be dealing with Echistai ancestral religious reversion. We'll have a number of presenters talking about various uh, expressions of ancestral religion of Nana Som. We'll be presenting on the Akan tradition, one of the blood circles of our people right here in North America. We have uh, Sister Kalinda Laveau, who's a Vodou queen in Louisiana, dealing with the Vodou tradition that was brought in the blood circles of our people hundreds of years ago prior to the Haitian migration into Louisiana, Vodou was already in Louisiana because we brought that in our blood circles and it's part of our ancestrally inherited tradition. I have a brother, Sa'ara Ankh, Sa who will be talking about the Yoruba tradition from that same perspective of transcarnational inheritance, spirit genetic inheritance of the Yoruba tradition as born in the blood circles of our people here in North America. Mama Mawusi Ashakir, who also deals with the Yoruba tradition, is part of that ancestral culture. She's also a midwife, homeschooler, um, teaches herbalism and natural health and so forth and certifies people in herbalism, dealing with natural roots and herbs and so forth for healing. So we're going to have a number of presenters and we will have a couple more presenters as well. So when you check the page, continue to check the page because we're, we're continuously continuously updating the information. So that's March 20th, um, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. in Washington, D.C., free event. You can, you'll see the registration link on the page, and it will lead you to our Afuraka Afuraka Nanasom Homa network. We have a social network outside of Facebook. We do interact on Facebook and other social media networks, but we also must have our own independent networks because, of course, we know that these different networks will shut your pages down whenever you publish information or talk about things that are too accurate, shut you down whenever they feel like it. So we must have our own separate social media networks, and we have one that we've had for a number of years, and through that network, you can register for the conference. And again, it's free registration. So that's what we'll be dealing with. Also, for the deadline that we've talked about, we extended the deadline because some people needed an extension with regard to uh, publishing. We're going to publish our Etsy sign and that's religious reversion journal. That book will be given away for free to everyone who comes to the conference. We will have articles on ancestral religion, different expressions of ancestral religious practice, talking about holistic health as well, natural health and healing, a number of different things. But it will also have the business directory, the Egua Marketplace directory, showcasing businesses, organizations, and institutions in the community that are serving us in a positive capacity. Those who would like to place ads in the journal for your business, your organization, your institution, your study group, um, originally, the deadline was this past, the minute out this past Saturday, but some people needed an extension because of simply because their payday didn't fall within that uh, deadline. So it's extended to this uh, this weekend, this <clears throat> uh, February 
February uh, 20th. So you have until this weekend, and we need to get those JPEG files in for the ad, that information in, because we need to begin to format the journal, the book, so we can have it ready, prepared, printed out, and so forth. We do all, all of our printing. We need to have that ready um, in time for the conference. So we need to this, – this is the hard deadline. This February 20th, this is the hard deadline. So um, the same for that. And we also, for the same reason, some people wanted to take advantage of our 1791 of 17 books for $91, that, that initiative, that particular sale that we had going on for, for a week um, in honor of the 1791 MENA rebellion of our people waging war and conspiring to wage war against the whites in our streams to free themselves from enslavement in, quote-unquote, 1791 in Louisiana. So we have the 17 books for $91. Normally our 30% off price for the entire 17-book set of ours is 111, which is 30% off. We went further for this specific week, and we had the 17 books for $91. Um, and for the same reason, some people, it didn't fall within their pay schedule, so we extended that as well So to, to the end of this week. So February 20th will be the last day for that as well. So if you'd like to order that 17-book set or the discounted rate of $91, you can do that this week. And, of course, you can go directly to our home our page, the publications page, to do that. Um, so, so when we we're talking about Akanton Nanasom, ancient, authentic, Akan ancestral religion. We have every Joda every Monday night. We're dealing specifically with the Akan expression of Nanasom or ancestral religion. Number one, because we are Akan. Number two, because of the misinformation that has been propagated and continues to be propagated in the Western Hemisphere as well as on the continent by those who have been infected by white culture and therefore they, their expression of traditional Akan religion, philosophy, cosmology, and so forth is infected. For example, trying to promote the foolish idea of monotheism, which does not exist in any of our cultures, that is a foolish uh, political structure forced on our people by the whites in our spring, trying to get us to follow a fictional deity that they are the representatives of. Of course, we recognize the reality that there is a great father and a great mother who we can communicate with directly, as well as the children of the great father and great mother, Nyamewa and Inyame, the great mother, great father, or Aminet, Amen, the children of them are the deities, the Abosom, the Bodu, the Orisha, the forces in nature. There are many thousands of divinities that we worship, communicate with, become possessed by, and so forth. So the idea of monotheism is pure stupidity. It has nothing to do with our culture, but infected individuals on the continent who have been infected with Christianity, Islam, and so forth try to force that foolish idea on our people because they've been brainwashed with the culture. As well as many of us, we deal with Akan and such religion from a, an authentic perspective. That includes our direct lineage from ancient Kana, which is a title of Nubia, and the Kani people, a title of the Nubian people. We migrated from ancient Kana to the west part of, western part of the continent and reestablished the Kana Empire a couple of thousand years ago after the fall of Kemet. And that Kanat Empire becomes the empire of Kanat or Ghana about a thousand years later because of Muslim invasions and deterioration. Some of our people migrated further south towards the forest belt in the Savannah region and reestablished a Kana or a Khan civilization in those regions, in the regions of today's Cote d'Ivoire and, and the Republic of Ghana. And a few hundred years later, some of those people were captured during the wars of enslavement and forced into the Western Hemisphere north. Central South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musu or Kessie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. And this is how people from ancient Kana, the Kani land, Nubia, made it to West Akuraka, Akuraka, as Akana or Akani people, and ended up in South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musu or Kessie. And of course, we maintained, as we said, our ancestral religious tradition. We published our book, for example, Hoodoo People, proving that the Hoodoo tradition in North America is the Akan tradition, Hoodoo being an Akan term, then with root work, root medicine, conjure, and so forth, and we dealt in detail with that. So we're talking about that transcarnational inheritance, spirit genetic inheritance. When we talk about ancestral religion, we're talking, and Nanason, which is our catch-all term for ancestral religion, 
that is the ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine God. That means through ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore and realign our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order, and thus restore balance to our lives. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion, incorporating law and restoring balance, incorporating law so that we can align our thoughts, intentions, and actions with order, repelling disorder so we can realign ourselves when we make mistakes and get off track. We repel disorder so we can realign ourselves with order, incorporating law and restoring balance, accepting order and rejecting disorder, expansion and contraction. So these are the expansive and contractive poles of non nasom and such religion. That is what, in essence, it is, the ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine balance. So when we deal with that in general on Tuesday nights for Ojida, dealing with various expressions of the culture, on Jodah on Monday night, we deal specifically with Akanfo Nanasom, Akanfo, ancient, authentic, Akan, ancestry religion. So we want to talk about this notion of Susu or Susu Hong, which is the term for meditation in the Akan language. Sometimes Individuals who have been misinformed, they assume that we never meditated until we came in contact with the whites and their offspring, these spiritual deviant spirits of disorder, which is insane. We didn't learn about meditation from white Aryan criminals who invaded India when it was originally populated by our people. We've been meditating for hundreds of thousands of years. So, for example, when you look at the image that we use for the show, and we show the sesh scribe, Her Imheb, sitting with his legs crossed, he has his uh, palate for scribing, and he's sitting in front of the baboon that is a animal totem for the divinity Tahuti. Now, when many people have seen that, you've seen that in books, you seen that image in books, you see that image on, you know, online and so forth, and many images just like that. We also show an image of one of the Aimsu, one of the kings, one of the Pera, so-called pharaohs, but one of the sovereigns kneeling in front of a statue of the divinity Atem, Atem Kepra, Atem Kopa, and I can't recall Odomankoma, and so forth. He's called Atemu Kopa, this is where you get Odomankoma and Akan. Uh, one of the functionaries of the Supreme Being. He's not the Supreme Being. So you'll see this uh, sovereign kneeling in front of a statue of the divinity. And then we also show another statue of a statue scribe kneeling or sitting. When you look at that image, when people who actually practice the culture, actually live the culture, they automatically know what they're looking at. When you see that sesh or that scribe sitting with his legs crossed, in front of the divinity, in real life, that, that divinity, of course, the deity is a force in nature. It's a spiritual entity, meaning it's invisible. What he's doing there is meditating. He's engaging in susu. He's meditating and communicating with a spiritual force in nature so he can learn directly from that force how to properly scribe the medutu the Medutin Toro, the so-called hieroglyphs and so forth, he's learning directly from a divinity. When you see the Aimsu, the sovereign, kneeling before Atem, he's not just kneeling before a statue. He knows the spirit is taking up a residence in the statue. He's engaged in spiritual communication. That is Susu, that is meditation, that is spiritual communication that's taking place. No different than we, we have our shrines here, ancestral shrines and shrines for the dead. And we have an incesso or an idol, a sculpture in the form of an idol, because we engage in idol worship, and only fools think it's something wrong with idol worship. The whites and offspring seek 
to make us believe that idolatry is evil and reality is brilliant and they are inferior, so they have no capacity to communicate with the forces of nature. No deity will communicate with them. We can establish a shrine. We can set up a sculpture, and the deity will take up a residence in the sculpture to communicate with us, to relay information to us, just like a spirit will possess somebody and communicate through the body of the person to the people in the room. We establish a shrine. We have a sculpture and so forth, and set so an idol, and the divinity will take up residence temporarily in that structure to communicate directly with us. And we have that experience on a daily basis, adults as well as children. So we know exactly what's taking place. The whites and their offspring want us to obey them and not obey any force in nature because when we listen to the forces in nature, that means we are incorporating divine order. Divine order is comprised of divine law, love, and divine hate. So we will seek only to incorporate law and exterminate our enemies. So we think don't want us to listen to the forces of divine order because divine order stamps out disorder and its purveyors, which includes the whites and offspring. So they wanted us to only obey and worship them. So they had to demonize idolatry, demonize spirit possession, demonize everything, and try to make us believe that real ritual practice is evil, and therefore we simply need to listen to these criminals, which is insane. So idolatry is divine, brilliant, divine practice. It is superior to anything the whites and their offspring have ever done. So we engage in this process on a regular basis. So when we see these uh, images and sculptures and so forth in ancient metal, or even if they're painted on papyri or on the walls and so forth, we know exactly what we're looking at because we engage this process on a regular basis, whether we're Akan or Yoruba, Igbo, Ebe Fong, we practice Kudu or Vodu and Juju and so forth. Gullah tradition in North America, we know exactly what's taking place. Now, you have other individuals, of course, the whites and offspring misinformed. They can't give you that proper definition. We know that the sesh is communicating with the divinity. But when you see a uh, queen mother um, standing next to a divinity, she's engaged in ritual communication. The spirit force of nature is an invisible entity. Just like magnetism, you can recognize the effect of magnetism, even though you don't see magnetism, two magnets pushing one another across the table, you recognize the force. In the same fashion, spirit possession takes place. We know when a spirit enters, and people who are clairvoyant can actually see the entity. But when you see drawings of divinity, spirit force, and nature, intimate, or you see the sculptures of the divinities, this is what's taking place, the spiritual communication. When you see image of him sitting there with his legs crossed, he is engaged in meditation, communicating with a dead. Now, of course, the white and offspring will try to distort that reality or won't even bring it up. People who engage the culture know what's happening. But then you also have Negroes who think that they're scholars or think they're linguists or think that they're studying some information, um, which they're really just teaching Egyptology in black space, falsely promoting themselves as Afrocentric, and they're not Afrocentric at all, and they have a foolish pseudo uh, method of trying to engage in, in engage in scientific inquiry. In reality, they have no knowledge of what they're talking about, and it's betrayed on a daily basis. They will look at these things and say, oh, this is just a symbol and represents this and represents that, because they have no knowledge, have no direct experience. They can't tell you directly from their experience who these deities are. They can't tell you who Osar is or Oset or Set, Nebuchadnezzar, and so forth, because they do not communicate with them because their minds are locked down in pseudo-empiricism. They can't engage in real scientific inquiry, which is rooted in ritual, to know exactly who these divinities are and communicate with them and show you from their experience who these Orisha, Abosom, Vodou, and so forth are. So their default position is to repeat the misinformation of the whites and their offspring and seek to blacken it up with pseudo-Afrocentric jargon and pseudo scholarship. So these individuals can't speak on ancient Kemet in reality or any ancestral religious tradition in reality because they have no experience. So we're going to talk about what real meditation is. So if you go to our publication, um, it's the Tassasa Tim. This is one of our 17 books. That's the first one that we're going to talk about. We're going to put the link in the chat room right quick. And you can go to page uh, 30. 
and the Patal Sasa Tim itself is a curriculum, an educational curriculum for Afuraikani and Afuraikani youth as well as adults, dealing with different aspects of culture, incorporating culture, grounding our people in who we are. And in fact, we'll go right quick through the, the seven module system designed to be implemented in seven sessions of 40 minutes with you. You're working with youth, you're working with adults in a school setting, after school setting, if you're in the human services field or you're just having, having you know, cultural classes or whatever you're doing on the weekends and so forth, um, introducing our people's culture, seven sessions of 40 minutes, whether you did it seven weeks in a row or seven days in a row, whatever, this is how it's designed. The seven modules are Okraden, Akuraka, Akuraka, talking about the, the value. The second piece is Abatun, talking about the value of physiology, talking about melanin and the seven-part definition of melanin. Maranechi, law and hate, talking about the nature of our purpose and function in creation. Nyansapo is a decision-making process, a seven-stage decision-making decision process rooted in our ancestral culture, which is a holistic model. Obrabo is ethical life dealing with ancestral ethics and morality and so forth. Asedie is responsibility, and it's a seven-tiered structure dealing with responsibility, which we're about to get into. And then the She and Shebia is talking about execution. But um, so there's a seven-module model system. We're going to deal with one of the modules, a, sex, a portion of one of the modules. So the sixth module, which was going to be the sixth session of the sixth week, um, a CDA, dealing with the value of responsibility. We're going to check that out. Part of that is on page 30. And when you scroll down to page 30, um, so that, that particular module is on page 30. Asedie means responsibility. And we lay out seven aspects of responsibility, a seven-stage process dealing with incorporating asedie or responsibility in our lives. So one of them deals with susu. So when we look at this text here, Asedie is the term from the tree language, Akan language, defines responsibility. Every Afurakani, Afurakani individual has an Nkra or an Nkrabia, a divine function to executing creation. And an Okra, Okra, a soul which contains the full potential of the individual. Your soul is divinity dwelling within the head region, the force in nature that dwells in your head region that's always pulling you for thoughts, intentions, and actions that are in harmony with divine order and repelling you from thoughts, intentions, and actions that would place you out of harmony with divine order. The reason why your soul, your ka, your ka'et, or okra, okra, and akan, that force in nature that's in the head region is pulling you towards certain kinds of thoughts, intentions, and actions is because it is encoded with a specific function you came into the world to execute. We as Afurakani and Afurakani people are cells within the great divine body of the supreme being. We come into being to execute specific functions within the great divine body. It's like every cell in your body has a specific function to execute within the body. Your cells are children of the organs or organ systems of which they are a part. So the liver cells execute liver functions. That's their quote-unquote destiny or their function in the divine body. And they support liver functions. They're supporting the whole body at the same time. When heart cells support heart functions, they're supporting the whole body at the same time. When pancreas cells support pancreas functions, they're supporting the whole body at the same time. We as cells are children of specific organs within the great divine body. Those organs are the deity that regulate order within the great divine body. They are the abosom, as they're called, nakan, the orisha, the bodu, and so forth. Unsoru, unsoru to divinity, that regulate order within the great divine body. We are cells of those divinities, those parent divinities, the ones that govern our spiritual heads and so forth. Because we're cells of those specific divinities, we have a specific function related to that force in nature. So therefore, we, we are naturally inclined towards certain kinds of thoughts, intentions, and actions, and disinclined from us. Nkra, Nkra, be a divine function is. So we have that divine potential encoded within our spiritual head, our spirit's brain. 
This potential must be actualized in order for the individual to properly execute his or her function in the world. It is therefore incumbent upon us to actualize our potential. We have a divine responsibility and obligation to cultivate, to develop ourselves physically and spiritually in order to realize our potential and then exercise our cultivated power and consciousness to execute our incrabia, incra, our divine function. We don't just recognize our potential. We have a divine responsibility, a sedie, an obligation to cultivate ourselves physically and spiritually, realize our potential, actualize our potential, and execute our function in the world. The cells of your liver don't just wake up and say, you know, we have a potential to, to work on oxidation of the blood and then never actually do that. They don't just learn about their potential. They have an obligation, a responsibility to execute that function. If they don't, they are creating disorder within the body. If we don't actualize our potential and execute our function on a consistent basis, we are cells that are becoming like cancer itself. We'll be we're engaged in disorder within the body. So we have a divine responsibility, a sedia, obligation. So, so that's the basis, and we're not going to go through all of that information. That's the basis of this specific module talking about a sedia responsibility, and then we deal with those seven aspects, those seven uh, principal values of a sedia responsibility in that module. When we go through that, and what we're going to focus on the, uh, the fourth one, but the seven, just to go through the seven, sleep regeneration, which is called a die in a car. You must get enough sleep, of course, to refuel yourself, regenerate yourself, and so forth, so that you can be ready to execute your function. The next uh, principal value of responsibility is Indrian, Indriani or Adriane, talking about diet. You must not only get enough sleep to regenerate yourself, but you must fuel yourself on a regular basis with the kinds of fuel, vitamins, minerals, and so forth from the foods that are in harmony with your body. That is your asetia responsibility, obligation, not just whatever feels good or tastes good, we take it in and become obese and self-destructive and so forth. That's childish. We're adults. We have a divine responsibility and obligation to fully cultivate ourselves and actualize our potential. So diet is the second principal value. The third principal value is, is ahuade, which means strength, talking about exercise. We must make our physical bodies tuned instruments that resonate the energy of the abosome and our own spirit body. It's like you have a wind chime that resonates or reverberates the energy and you hear the sounds and so forth when you have a top string and you pluck a top string, then it resonates and reverberates sound. If the string is loose, quote unquote flabby, then it won't reverberate any sound. When it's tight and strong, like a guitar string and so forth, then it reverberates the sound that you're trying to generate, which is sound vibrations, which is a release of energetic vibrations that affect people in a specific manner. We make our physical body, physically, externally, and internally, toned instruments to reverberate the energy of the abosome that governs. That's our divine responsibility, asedia. So those first three are the physical asedia. Then we get to susu, meditation, study, and then the next one is to refine, which is the term is tree in our con, refine those abilities, you, your potential, your capacity, but you refine them. Then and the spiritual energy you have been given by the Supreme Being to execute your function in the world, you refine those capacities that you have, physical and spiritual. Once they are refined so you can perfect yourself, then you utilize what you have to build. So first you Recognize your potential, refine your potential. Once you develop those skills and so forth and those spiritual capacities, then you go forward and build. And the term is ba, means to make or create or to build. And, that, and the seventh principal value is to chere chere, which means to articulate or explain, to demonstrate or articulate the value of what you have built for the community, children as well as adults. Because when they value what you have built, recognize the value of what you have built, through your spiritual capacity, then they will value that institution or that entity you've developed, preserve what you have built for them and for our posterity if they value what you have built and 
where you say value, what you would build is for you to articulate the value of what has been built. And they will also um, have respect for the protocols that were put in place for you to come to that position that you were able to build what you built. So, chere, chere, to explain or articulate the value of what has been established. So, those are the seven principal values, but we're going to focus on number four, which is susu in the Akan language. We look at the term susu. We can go through real quick some of the definitions in the Akan, Asante Asante Dictionary. The root, of course, su means essence, nature, character, quality. And this is why you have the term su, bind, which means character, the fence, bind, which is around the su, the essential nature. So su bind means character, like su bind pa means good character, su bind bani means evil, bad character, and so forth. But the su is your essential nature, your essence. And bind is the, abai means fence in general, but bind means the fence. Bind, which is around the su, your essential nature. So that is what your character is. It is the fence that's around your essential nature. That's what you express when you act and function in the world. But su meaning essential nature, essence of the person. A related term, sua or suya, means to learn. Just like to study, to learn. And students are called osuya fo, those group of people, fo, who are engaged in the process of suya or sua, which means to learn, to study. But then we get into the term, which is double susu. And it can be spelled S-U-S-U, but sometimes S-U-S-U-W. Susu means to measure. In general, means to measure. When you talk about susu hon, and home means self. So to measure sun su, yourself at home means meditation, study, reflecting upon yourself. That's what sun su is talking about. Sun su meaning to measure, to calculate, to estimate. It also means to think, to imagine, to suppose, to presume, and so forth, to measure, to meditate, to understand, to learn, and all these different things. This is what sun su or meditation means in the Akan language. We go before the Nkomre, the shrine, sit at the shrine, we pour libation, engage in Oshue, pour libation, invoke the Abosom, evoke the Nananoman Samafo, the deities and ancestral spirits, and once those spirits come forward after pouring libation and invoking them and evoking them through ritual prayer, now that they are present, then we sit down to Ua, or Suya, learn, and engage that process of Susu, meditation, to measure, to calculate, to understand, to inquire, to think, to study, and learn directly from them. And once we learn from them, then we can move forward and execute our functioning creation in a harmonious way, uphold that asedie, that divine responsibility or obligation. That's what Su Su is talking about in the Akan language. Then you'll have the term in ancient Kemet. He talked about Su meaning essential essence. Then you have the term Soon, in ancient Kemet, meaning to know. And then the plural term with the determinative of uh, male or men and women, soon, meaning wise or learned men or women. You also have the term soon, soon, in ancient Kemet, meaning to entreat, to petition, to supplicate, to convert. And the person is on his knees and he has his two hands up in the air in the form of a ritual. Provocation. So we're talking about ritual entreating, ritual, ritual supplication, ritual petitioning, talking about invoking the abosom, evoking the di- divinity, so that to convert, so to entreat, position, or to petition, to supplicate, to convert, through ritual provocation. And we talked about that ritual provocation when the hands are up in the air, with the palms facing outward. It is a provocation of the energy of the abosom, that's the um, dua. Uh, symbol or, or, you know, medut that you see in ancient command. We talked about that in the Torah, Torah, being the origin of the term Torah, Torah, the worship of God, so forth. And you see people standing. It looks like their hands are in the, facing the sky, facing the sun, their palms facing forward. They're provoking the energy of the Abotom. This is the same position 
with this determinative symbol. So when they're talking about entreating or petitioning or supplicating or conversing, they're talking about ritual entreating, ritual supplication, ritual petitioning, ritual conversing. Who are they conversing with in this term, sun sun? Conversing with the abosom, conversing with the insumako, conversing with the deities and ancestral spirits. So the same term, susu, in Akan, talking about to think, to measure, to communicate with, to learn directly from, talking about meditation, talking about internal spiritual, dealing with the spirit, this term in ancient Kemet, Sun Sun, is talking about to converse, to petition, ritually provoke and so forth, so that you can learn, so you can soon, the other term in ancient Kemet, to know, or wise learned men, soon. Talking, this is soon and Sun Sun, the same term in ancient Kemet, and then you also have the term Sun, meaning air or to breathe, and sun sun, meaning they'll say to kiss the earth or to prostrate before earth, but it also means to smell, to breathe, but they're talking about sun sun, meaning to breathe, sun sun, talking about to learn, to meditate, learn wise men and so forth, sun sun, talking about to entreat ritual provocation, that those terms are all tied together. When you engage in ritual provocation to entreat, to provoke the energy, then you reflect internally with your spirit, soon, soon, you entreat, soon, soon, ritually provoke, and you do that through ritual, soon, soon, talking about breathing in the process of meditation. So these things, the exact same term in Akan, the exact same term in ancient Kamehameha, there are variations on those terms. You can find that in the Medutu, the Hieroglyphic Dictionary. And, of course, just as we do with our various publications, we show the exact same term in the Medusu, and in our traditional language. And that can be done not just with the Akan language, but across the board, wherever our people are on the continent. So let's get into a little bit further with that specific section. We talked about, in this specific section, in the Patasa Sassatim, we talk about the Asedie of Sleep. That's the first uh, principle of Asedie of Responsibility. We said the idea of sleep, meaning the responsibility of sleep, is the foundation of all that occurs afterwards. Our body and spirit are rejuvenated through the sleep function. It is our means of regeneration. It is so important to our proper development that if we deny our body sleep, our body will ultimately take it from us. We will inevitably collapse. Our consciousness is renewed and our energy replenished during the sleep state. So I die or sleep regeneration is the first principle of Asede, the first uh, principle of responsibility. The second Asede is the Asede or responsibility or obligation of diet, Indriane or Adriane, Indriane, and so forth, diet. The Asede of diet is critical to our ability to properly function. Proper nourishment not only energizes our bodies, but it also, also nourishes our capacity for proper thinking, analyzing, judging, behaving, and so forth. Clarity of thought and insight is dependent upon a proper diet. Through diet, we maintain balance in our bodies, and this directly affects the level of balance we experience spiritually. And, there's, of course, there's a connection spiritually to the physical body. Your body needs to be a tuned instrument, properly tuned outside as well as inside, so that you can function properly. It's no different than a television or a cell phone and so forth. The energy moving through the television when you plug it in is the same energy, electricity, or in the computer. But if the circuitry is bad, then once that same energy moves through, then there are sparks and everything else that doesn't work properly. But if the circuitry is properly structured, then the energy moves through the cord, and then you get the luminous pictures and the sound and so forth that you need. You have a spirit entered into your mother's womb now, if the body itself becomes degenerate or the brain cells and synapses and so forth, for example, somebody doing drugs like marijuana, cocaine, or heroin and so forth, destroys brain cells, and yes, the spirit may be a spirit that is all right, but the physical body is operating from just shooting out sparks and so forth, and the person begins to act in an erratic fashion. People who have, for example, deficiency in vitamin B can become depressed and so forth because of what happens uh, physically, and they need to uh, get those proper levels of vitamin B and so forth. So 
that our study of diet in Driane is key. Clarity of thought and insight. The assedie of exercise, as we talked about, is the third of the physical assedie. Exercise enables us to tone our physical body, that it may serve as an instrument, a tuning fork to harmonize us and our activities with the harmonious vibrations, energy streaming from the okra, the okra, the soul, the divine consciousness, the divinity in the head region. These harmonious vibrations are the message of the okra and probably our divine physical assedie or principles of responsibility. Then the fourth principle, of course, is the susu, the meditation, as we said, the asedie, or responsibility of meditation, study, calls for focused observation. Meditation is a ritual means by which we redirect the focus of our consciousness. We direct the focus of our consciousness to our nkra, nkrabia, the terms in our con for our divine function. Why do we come in, what function do we come into the world to execute? That's where we return our focus. Every thought, every intention and action should be in alignment with our divine function. So when we direct the focus of our consciousness to our nkra, nkrabia, we learn what our function in life is. When we direct the focus of our consciousness to the unique structure of our spirit, we learn, suya, term again, to learn, suya, the specific means by which we must develop our spiritual capacity, potential, and talent, develop our awareness and intuition, receptivity and retention, defensive and offensive power, intellect, judgment, creativity, wisdom. When we engage in focused observation of things, entities, or events in the world, we learn how the various things, entities, and or events could positively or negatively inform and influence our expression of our talents in life. So focused observation, we focus on our divine function so we know who we are, what our function in the world is. We focus on our spiritual capacity. What energy complex have we been given? Do we have a naturally fiery energy complex because we're ch children of the, you know, fire, fire divinity? We have a cool, watery, healing energy complex. We learn that through focused observation, through susu, susu hall, learning from the structure of our spirit body, learning from the abosom that govern us, learning from the nananoman for our spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors who also give us guidance in that process. We learn what our function is and we learn what our spiritual capacities are, our potential. And then, of course, once we learn that, then we develop that and we actualize that. And that's the next principle. But we learn that through Susu Paul, through meditation, learning about those various things. And then we engage in focused observation of things, objects, events in the world. And we have focused observation because we engage Susu, meditation, measurement, calculation, study, learning. Then we have that focused observation, entities and events in the world. We learn are the various things, objects, deeds, entities that manifest in the world are either positive for our functioning or negative, and then we can make the proper decision. So when we're constantly training our adjuni, training our mind for focused observation on every aspect of life, then we can make proper decisions. So that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about Susu Ho. That's the value of developing that Susu Ho, that meditation capacity. Now, we're going to get into to the Uben Shang and get further into the nature of Susu meditation in a couple of different expressions. So the Uben Shang is one of our books. I'll put the link in the chat room. Of course, as we said earlier, all of the ebook versions of our books are free downloads from our website, but then we also sell the soft cover versions as well. We'll put that link, Uben Shang, the Ancestral Summons, and that link is in the chat room. And we're going to scroll down, see what page that is. All right. So that first piece you see is on page 15. In fact, it is the second, no, it is the third piece uh, in the Uben Shang. And the title is Meditation. Participation, ancestral deity possession. 
Now, the book Uben Shang is a number of different pieces on different aspects of ritual practice, showing the functionality of our ritual practices. One of them here talks about meditation. One is talking about ancestral and deity possession. One is talking about ancestral and deity communication. One is talking about our ancestral names. One is talking about ritual song, ritual dance, um, idol worship, uh, nature worship, um, a number of different things, talismans, amulets, ritual prayer, all the different things we engage in ritually. We show the ritual functionality. When we engage in ritual process, it's never simply symbolic. The whites and offspring engage in silly symbolic rituals. You see the Pope and the Catholic Church moving their hands around and swinging incense around and so forth. They're engaged in pseudo-empty ritual that has no function at all. We don't engage in pseudo-empty ritual. Or like the Muslims bending down and placing their head on the ground, that's doing nothing. They're not communicating with any divinity. They're just engaged in empty ritual that they imitated from other people. When we engage in ritual practice, we're always engaged in the process of receiving, processing, and transmitting energy in a specific, measured, and quantifiable fashion. If we're not engaged in that process, then we don't engage in the ritual process. So each one of these essays is information given to us by the Nananoma Nsumapo and the Abosom of Akwamumai, the Kwamu Nation of North America, given this information. So we just simply took down the information we were given by the Abosom and the Nananoma Nsumapo specifically, and that's how we crafted this specific piece. So I'm going to read this through this information and go through the detail. And the way the Nsumampo, the Nananoma Nsumampo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors speak very often is in a question and answer kind of format to get us to think that we simply took down the information as they directed us to present it. So this piece, Meditation, Participation, Ancestral Deity Possession. Meditation facilitates conscious participation. Through meditation, we transfer our conscious focus from the external plane to the internal plane. We thus come to participate consciously in the spirit world, the community of ancestral spirit, deity. Who exists who does not operate on both planes? Does your thought, your spirit, not influence your physiology, physical act? Should not the thoughts of the ancestral spirits who remain connected to you to your physiology, their blood aim to influence you if they must return through you. Do they not have an interest then in assisting you, your community? We consciously allow different thoughts, spirit energy, to direct our physical body and behavior, whether guided or misguided. Should we not consciously allow the ancestral spirit and their thoughts energy to direct our physical body and behavior during ritual that they may bring a message of wisdom. This is ancestral possession. When you decide to take water into your system, the decision is an act of the will. Yet as the digestion of this substance is an act which is in harmony with the laws that govern your physiological makeup, this act of will is united with the divine will. The carrying out of this directive is facilitated through power, what moves your arm towards the glass, what directs the glass to the mouth. To possess is to exert influence or control over. Your arm, muscles, nerves are possessed by the power under the direction of the will. It is the will and power working in concert which possess you to grab the glass and lift it. This is possession by an unseen power. When the raindrop falls back into the river, it becomes one with the river. It loses its own direction and is now directed by the river's flow. It is possessed by the river. It is the river. When one returns his or her focus of consciousness back to the source of all he she becomes one with or is possessed by this flowing river of being. When one focuses his or her consciousness on a particular aspect or phase of creative power, talking about the abosom, then one comes to know that phase of power one possesses, that power becomes dominated by, participates in the power, 
he she becomes that power deity. This is deity possession. So when you see someone possessed by an Abosong and a Risha Vodou and so forth, as we said before, it's similar to someone driving in a car and then someone else gets in the car and then the other person gets in the back seat. They are still in the vehicle if someone else is directing the vehicle and directing the steering wheel and so forth. The person in the back seat is watching and seeing everything that's taking place and seeing where the vehicle is going, but they are not in uh, possession of the direction of the vehicle at that point because they allow someone else to drive. That's like a deity possessing someone entering into your physical vehicle. Now, both of you are operating within the same vehicle, but they are at the driver's will at that point. So when you see someone possessed at a ritual, the Abosom comes down and possesses the person through ritual song, ritual dance, and so forth. The Abosom is speaking the language, the tree language, or the Yoruba, the, Arish, the, the Yoruba language if they're an Arisha possessing and so forth, the fallen language if they're practicing Vodou. The spirit takes up residence in the physical body of the person. They are sharing that physical body at that point. They speak through the physical body. They speak to the community. They touch the community, heal people, direct people, admonish disorder and so forth so they can communicate directly with the population. So this is what we're talking about, spirit possession, deity possession. Do you feel heat in the summer and cold in the winter? Do you feel heat at midday and coolness at midnight? Can all phases of creative power become manifest and dominate space simultaneously, or is the exhibition of creative power phase? Time orders and conditions the cyclical manifestation of all phases of creative power, the divinity. So the deities, the forces of nature, operate in harmony with order. They function in an interdependent fashion, governed by time, governed by the structure designed by the great mother and great father. They are organs within the great divine body of Aminet and Amen, and they operate in harmony with time, which structures the cyclical manifestation of their movement. Who questions possession? Who exists who is not conditioned by time? To participate in or awaken each phase of divine power is to facilitate union by possession through time. So when we say participate in, we're invoking the Abosom, participating in that power that they're bathing us with, so we can focus in harmony, get back in alignment with order, get back in alignment with the time or the structure that governs all functioning things in creation that are natural, that are ordered. Our descent is of the ancestral spirits, which by definition includes the deities, for there are circular lineage, or circulage is of the great ancestral spirit we are possessed of this power at birth. So when we're talking about that, once again, the lineage, a schematic of that is your body, as an Afurakani man, your body is an Afurakani woman, you are like Amen and Amenet in miniature. And then your organs are the deities, the Abosom, the forces in nature that regulate order in your body. The organs of the Supreme Being are the forces in nature that regulate order in all of creation, the universe. And then the children of the organs are the cells. Plant life, animal life, mineral life, and Afurakani, Afurakani, human life, just like your cells are the children of your organs, and your organs are the children of you, the great body. So that's the hierarchy. That's what we're talking about. So when we talk about our lineage, your cells are of a lineage, of the organ that they are a part of, the organ system they are a part of, and ultimately of the great body, the great being, which is you. That's our lineage as well in relationship to the forces of nature and the supreme being. And then the second piece we want to deal with in relation to that, so that's giving an uh, insight into what meditation is, conscious participation in the functioning as a cell within the great divine body, within that organ and organ structure. And the second piece on the next page, song and dance is ritual possession meditation. So we say sound is power manifest. Rhythm is power condition. Different vibrations, different rhythms. Different rhythms, different power. God's power manifests through sound rhythm. Goddesses energy manifests through God. So we're talking about male and female divinity. We are captivate, captivated by this sound. We are animated by this rhythm. We exist through form as this sound rhythm. You will operate consciously as God is God, talking about Amenet and Amen, when you have cultivated the fullness of consciousness and power which lay dormant within you, that was placed in you by spirit, talking about Ra and Ra'at. 
So our okra, okra, our soul, our divine consciousness, is placed in our head region, directed there by the great mother and great father, Aminet and Amen, or Inyamewa and Inyamet. So we have a divine function to execute that's wired in our spirit's brain, our spiritual head. We will realize that and operate consciously as Aminet and Amen, meaning in harmony with divine order, when we cultivated the fullness of our consciousness and power. And we talked about that with regard to responsibility. It is our responsibility to fully cultivate ourselves physically and spiritually, to realize our physical power, our spiritual capacities, what kind of energy complex we have and how to utilize that energy complex, how to expand it and contract it, open it and close it, shut it on, turn it on, shut it off, and so forth. How do we use the energy we have been given? First, we have to recognize what it is through susu, meditation, study, measurement, calculation, learning from the abosom and insomaf or from our own kra. Kra, while we learn that and we learn what our spiritual capacities are, then we cultivate ourselves and refine our talent, refine our capacity, develop it, and then we use that to build, to execute our function. So this is why it says when you have cultivated the fullness of your consciousness and power, which lay dormant within you, that which was placed in you by spirit. And here, spirit, we're talking about Ra and Ra at the creator of great dress. Fulfillment occurs then as your spirit's form is consciously united with the great spirit's form, talking about Ra and Ra. At. Your power now in conscious harmony with Ra and Ra's power. Meditation, alteration of conscious focus, opens the way, for it is the means by which one becomes open to receive possess the sounds, rhythms, powers of creation. Song and dance are expressive forms of chant, chant, trance, provocation. So now we talk about ritual song. Song is generation of power, a revelation of sound. The voice vibrations unveil power. Why should this power not be wisely directed towards turning the keys to unlock every phase of creative power? Song is truly ritual. Spirits ordered movement or vibration ritualize the song of cosmos. And energy moving through space generates sound, vibration. So Ra and Ra's ordered movement or vibration in creation ritualize the song of cosmos. Its harmony is captured and reverberates by or through space perpetually. And that's no different than when you swing a rope around the air, you hear a sound. When you hear wind whip around through the jet stream, you hear sounds and so forth. So the energy of Ra and Riot expands and contracts through creation. They generate sound vibrations. And when you consume spiritually, that ritualizes the song of cosmos. There are sound vibrations emanating from the movement of Ra and Riot throughout creation, including through the movement of our body. They are ordered movement and vibrations Ritualize the song of cosmos. Its harmony is captured and reverberates by through space perpetually. Should you not seek to hear and echo this song, these sounds, this power, so you are tuned to the movement of Ra and Ra, you hear those sound vibrations and you replicate them through your vocal cords, and that's when you have a harmonious set of sound vibrations or song emanating from you because you're replicating the song or movements or sound vibrations of Ra and Ra moving through space. Should you not sing as spirit sing, directing your voice vibration in forms, songs, displaying spirit's harmony in order to facilitate possession empowerment. Song as ritual is possession meditation. So those sound vibrations, when they're harmonious, it's like someone can sing and the sound vibrations can break a glass. The sound vibrations stimulate not only the physical organs of the person, but the spirit body of the person. If it's a harmonious song based on the energy coming from Ron Riot, those sound vibrations can be directed to move people, move people towards harmony. Sound vibrations can help destroy um, blockages in the energy system, even destroy cells that are cancerous and so forth. Sound therapy or sound vibrations, no different than laser therapy destroying cancer cells or sound vibrations that can break a glass. They can also destroy uh, wayward cells as well. So sound vibrations in and of themselves, when it's a harmonious sound, 
replicating the song of cosmos that's generated by the movement of Ra and Ra through creation. When you attune to that, replicate it, and repeat it with your vocal cords, you engage in ritual process. Song is ritual position meditation. And then we deal with ritual dance. Isamafo direct us to talk about ritual dance. Dance is the generation of power, a revelation of rhythm. The movement wields power. Why should this power not be wisely directed towards opening the doors which will unleash every phase of creative power? Dance is truly ritual. Spirits or Ra and Ra'et's ordered movements, rhythm, ritualize the dance of cosmos. The energy moving through space ritualizes the quote-unquote dance or movement, the cyclical movement of everything in creation, harmoniously ritualizes the the dance of cosmos. Its rhythm is displayed by the celestial body. Their harmonious interactions or choreography is displayed by animals, by nature. The movements of animals in nature, they move in a rhythmic fashion and they move in a harmonious fashion. And wherever you see them anywhere in the world, they're operating in a similar fashion. Should you not seek to absorb and imitate this dance, this movement, this power, should you not dance as spirit dances, directing your body movements in forms, dances, displaying spirit's rhythm in order to facilitate possession, empowerment, dances, ritual, possession, meditation. So the movements that you see in our ritual dances or when the abosom possess or the intimafo possess, movements of arms in certain directions are wielding energy. Movements of legs in certain patterns are wielding energy no different than if you swing a rope in the air or you move an object in the air and it's wielding energy. Specific movements wield fiery energy or cool energy or receive and transmit various expressions of energy. Dances are ritual dances, are ritual processes to wield energy. It's a ritual possession, meditation, and so forth. So then they ask the question, who speaks against song and dance as possession? Ritual song and dance is the earthly replication of cosmic sound and rhythm. It is possession through meditation. Different song forms engender receptivity to specific phases of creative power, divinity, abosa. Different dance forms engender receptivity to specific phases of creative power, abosom, divinity. Musical instruments work to mediate and channel the powers, the divinities, into the human instrument. You are possessed perpetually of Ra and Ra'et, or the great spirit, sound, song, the great spirit's rhythm or dance. Ritual possession meditation is conscious reconnection, union, Amen, and so forth. So we want to lay that foundation for this whole notion of what susu meditation is, what we are engaging in, what we are attuning to, even through song and dance. That's another expressive form of meditation, conscious focus, focused observation on specific phases of creative power, talking about the forces in nature, as well as the nananoma and samapho, spiritually cultivated ancestors of the NASA. But that definition going back to Su meaning to learn, Su, su meaning to measure, to calculate, to study, to know, also meaning to breathe in ancient commit, to entreat, to supplicate, to um, deal with ritual provocation and so forth. This is what Su Su is talking about. So when we engage that process, pouring libation at the shrine or, or out in nature and so forth, when you go before the Abosom, the force of nature, or your ancestresses and ancestors, first we invoke the divinities, evoke the ancestresses and ancestors through ritual, whether it's ritual prayer, ritual song, ritual dance, libation, whatever it is. And then once we provoke them, call them forth, no different than you getting on the phone and calling family members, and then they all come to the house. Once they come to the house and sit down and you give them some food and so forth, then you sit down, these elders and elders, and listen to them and get direction from them. When we engage the process of ritual practice, we provoke the energy of the abosom and insamafo that is calling them forward. And once they come forward at the shrine or wherever we are, then we sit down and engage the process of susu and susu hong meditation 
study, learning, reflection, and so forth, so that we can receive what they are transmitting, process that, and operate according to that wisdom. You're doing that whether you're sitting in front of a shrine with the deities and ancestral spirits or with your own kra, your, the divinity that dwells in the head region, called the okra for males, okra for okrawa for females, ka and ka in the ancient Kemet, the order you knew and so forth in Yoruba and the state leader of Bodun, the chi in Igbo, that divinity as well where we have a shrine for the kra. We sit and communicate with that divinity that dwells, dwells in the head region. Su meaning to meditate. Su meaning to learn, study. Su, su, su also meaning to breathe. Now, it's not about simply um, some elaborate breathing techniques and all of that. It's not all focused on that. What it's showing is the terms, su, dealing with meditation, calculation, study, learning, knowledge, breathing, all those things are all interconnected. interconnected. When you engage in ritual provocation and the abosom comes forth or you can communicate with your own cross and you sit down and learn, your breathing will become regulated on its own. It will begin to become regulated in connection with the two is learning, two learning, meditation, study, but you have a focused observation. You're not just meditating on the abyss and trying to escape the cycle of reincarnation, that kind of nonsense, or quote-unquote, I'm going to try to become enlightened, that kind of nonsense. We have a focused observation. We actually have a function in creation. We have a purpose because we have a soul, a divine consciousness. The Western offspring don't have that, so they're trying to escape. In the West, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, they're trying to escape the world and get to heaven or paradise. Because they hate the world, they despise the world because they are cancerous cells, and they're not in harmony with the world. So they want to demonize the world, say the world is evil, the flesh is weak. Their flesh is weak and perverse and degenerate. The world is hostile to, to them because they are spirits of disorder, so they despise the world and try to escape the quote-unquote heaven. In the East, they're trying to escape the cycle of reincarnation. It's the same fake philosophy, just in a different expression. They think that being in the world or reincarnating is a negative thing, and they're trying to escape, and like, I want to finish my work here so I never have to reincarnate. That's stupidity. They don't have a purpose here. I thought they are full of that great earth mother is a divinity. This is divine. It's sacred to be in the world. Whites and offspring have no capacity to understand that because this world is not sacred to them because they are cancerous cells. Just like cancerous cells in the body, it's a hostile environment. The immune system is constantly trying to kill them and expel them from the body. So they're trying, yes, they would try to escape the body because it's a hostile environment for them. But the heart cells, liver cells, pancreas cells, and everything else, they don't see the, the body as a hostile environment that they're trying to escape. They're trying to function within the body because that's the way they're designed. The same thing with us. And cells within the great divine body of the supreme being. This is a sacred place fashioned by the supreme being. So we're not trying to escape the world or escape the cycle of incarnation, or escape into, quote-unquote, heaven, or enlightenment, and so forth. And, of course, the whites and offspring don't even know what that means. So, this is what we're engaged in when we're talking about susu, ho, meditation, study, calculation, invocation, supplication, and so forth, breathing. All of these things are combined. We have that focused observation, focus on the abosom that govern us, what our function in the world is, what our spiritual capacities are, how to develop those, as well as the focused observation on what's going on in our environment, what's in harmony with order, what's out of harmony with order, and how to embrace those things that are harmonious and repel those things, objects, deeds, and entities that are disharmonious. This is our obligation. When we talk about a city and obligation, we're talking about when people are children and growing into adulthood, they learn these lessons as children. Not just once you become old, then you can start talking about being responsible. This starts as children, and children engaging the process of su su hong, self reflection, meditation, and so forth, so they can become those young adults who began to um, engage a responsible lifestyle, embrace their divine obligation, or asedi. I die, seek regeneration, adriani or indriani. Diet in a harmonious way, a whole day in strength, talking about exercise, in the asedie of responsibility, talking about susu hong, um, meditation, study, and then 
trees to refine, thought to build, and chere chere to explain, to articulate, and so forth, those seven principal values of asere, responsibility, to start as children. We teach these principal values as children. They develop as they're growing and developing, incorporating these things on a regular basis. We should not have people who are in their late teens, 20s, and 30s still operating like children. Of course, we see that all over Facebook, social media, movies, television. Our people are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, still making excuses for not being responsible, still making excuses for not engaging the adai or sleep regeneration, regeneration process, still making excuses for not engaging the Adriane or Adrian dietary obligation in a harmonious and responsible way. So they're degenerating themselves through obesity or malnourishment and making excuses for that, smoking, drinking, making idiotic excuses and pseudo-spiritual rationales for smoking marijuana or smoking cigarettes and cigars and drinking or saying we're, we're just human and we only have one life and there's nothing wrong with a little smoke and drink. All that kind of idiocy, irresponsible behavior that is, you know, encoded in, their, in us with, by the whites and their offspring, by this perverse culture. That is who they are. That has nothing to do with us. We have an okra, okrawa, a divinity that dwells in the head region that constantly directs us towards every thought, every intention, every action should be in harmony with divine order, and we repel those thoughts, intentions, and actions that will place us out of harmony with divine order without any excuse. And when we get to the Ahuade, talking about strength, power, exercise, people make excuses for not engaging that process, operating and making excuses like children. And of course, when we get to Susu Hong, meditation, study, focused observation, when we haven't done those three uh, physical asedies, then we try to get to the, the non physical asedie, the first one dealing with Susu meditation, and then later tree to refine and bulk to build and chere chere to explain or articulate. We have problems because we're not engaged. We're still engaged in um, immature behavior, immature excuses and so forth. This is why Susu Hall is very key to keep our focus observation. So it's key to everything that we do. That's why it's right in the middle. The three physical asete, the three spiritual asete, and the meditation Susu Hall is right in the middle. And, of course, meditate, medi means middle and so forth. All right, so we're going to get on the phone line real quick. We have a few, a couple of calls, and look in the chat room. Um, we see we have some comments there. And we want to make sure we didn't miss anything. Okay, so in the chat room, uh, one of the questions, how do we focus our thoughts on the ka kaet? Is there something that we should be saying specifically or a chant? And let me see. We had a couple other questions. want to make sure we didn't miss anything. All right. So, for example, there are shrines for the Ka and Ka, that's in ancient Kemet, that's in our Khan culture, the shrine for the Okra, the Okra was the soul, the divine consciousness. In the Yoruba tradition, they have a shrine for the Ori, an Ibori shrine and so forth. That's a shrine for that kind of focused observation. Now, on our website, we have a document called a sample apai, meaning a sample prayer in Kemet, in the language of Kemet, with Akan vocalizations for the language. So it's a basic prayer in the language of Kemet. We have the, link, the prayer in the language, but then we also have the translation in English. We have some background information about what the terms mean and so forth. And then we have a link to an audio version so you can hear the prayer. It's just a basic prayer um, that any of our people can use. And then it, that's, it's a basic prayer, but it can be used for libation as well. And in addition to that, there's a short prayer to the Ka and, or, and Ka on that document as well. Um, so you can download that. And in fact, let me put that Pull that link up in the chat room or post it in the chat room. It's on the Aljita uh on our page, on our website, but I'll put the direct link in there. Just give me a second. 
All right. So the name, the name of the document is Sample Vocalization of Apai, which means prayer from Kemet, using Akan tree, Akan language. And that simply means it's composed in the language of Kemet, but very often they don't know how to pronounce the word, like NTR, they think it's Netter. And of course, it's actually Ntoro in the Akan tradition, Ntoro. So we can properly vocalize the language the terms in the language of Kemet because we still speak the language. And it's not just our com, but various languages. So, um, so that link we just put in the chat room. So you can, if you don't know what specific ancestral group you are incarnate of, you can use the language of ancient Kanat and Kemet, because of course, the various groups we derive from that ancient source, going back forty plus thousand years, not just pre-dynastic, but going back tens of thousands of years, where we migrated from ancient Kanat, Nubia, and Kemet to the various parts of the continent. This is why the languages are directly, directly de derived, have the same words, same meanings in the various languages that you find in the Medusa, the hieroglyphic dictionary, and so forth, the parent language. You'll find that we have the same deities with the same descriptive titles all over the continent and into the Western Hemisphere, wherever we migrated or were forced to migrate. So that parent culture is ancient Kanat, Nubi, as well as Kemet. So if you don't know what group you come from, your ancestresses and ancestors of ancient Kemet, utilizing that language, you can utilize that language. And, of course, it is their responsibility to direct you as to the specific group you are incarnate of. So, but then some people have found out what specific group they are incarnate of, and they can use that language of ancient Kemet as well as the contemporary language of the culture, whether it's Akan or Fon or Fon or Ebe or whatever it is. They can utilize that language. But if you don't know what group you're from, you can utilize that language of ancient Kemet. We compose a short prayer to the Ka, the Ka'et, on that document. You can look at that. If you know what group you're from, you can look up those prayers in the language, or you can compose one in the language, but very often you'll find in language uh, books or things like that, in the Akan or Yoruba or whatever, in their language, a prayer to the Ori in Yoruba, a prayer to the Akra and Akan. We, we have a prayer in the Akan language as well on the website. Um, so you can check that out as well. But what you're basically doing is establishing that very portable shrine, or if, even if you went outside and so forth, if you're in a house where you don't, you know, living in a room or something like that, renting a room out, you can have a portable shrine that you can uh, open up and close when you finish engaging the ritual process and um, putting away, if you're living in a place where people are trying to block you from practicing your ancestral religion and so forth, um, or even if you go outside and so forth and go into nature and sit down, you can engage that process. But what you're doing is utilizing that prayer to invoke the Ka, the Kayat, and it's no different than invoking any other divinity because your Ka, your Kayat is a deity in and of itself. You're calling that divinity forth through the ritual prayer. Then you sit down and you engage, Susu, you listen. No different than you calling someone on the phone. They come to your house. And once they come and sit down, then you sit down and listen, ask them the questions you want to ask, and then you listen and attune to what they are directing you to do or clearing up for you and so forth. The kayat is a divinity, so typically we feel that as a pull in the head or a push, specific, you know, desire towards certain kinds of thoughts, intentions, and actions, and a um, push away from other ones. But the more you engage the ka and kayat, you will recognize and learn that it's, of course, a divinity that you will be able to communicate directly with, and sometimes that divinity will show himself or herself to the individual, sometimes in dreams, sometimes right there at the shrine and so forth, so you'll have that direct communication. But you're communicating or listening to things that you're trying to learn. You don't have to vocalize them in English, simply generating the image in your mind of what you're trying to get to because they're already attuned to what you're trying to learn. It's no different than, you know, a baby who can't speak the language yet. They're just saying baby talk and so forth, but you're attuning to the spirit of the child and looking at their mannerisms and so forth and saying what they're reaching out for, what they want, what they're trying to stay away from, and you attune to them and you can meet their needs. 
and then eventually they learn how to speak the language to you so you, they can talk to you and tell you what they need. But before they learn how to speak the language, you can still attune to them, and that's how we take care of our babies as they're developing. The same thing with us. We don't speak the ancestral language right now. The deities and ancestral spirits are tuned to what we need, just like babies. They're tuned to our spirits and what we desire. So when we sit in front of the shrine to attune to our ka, our kayak, they're attuning to our, what we desire to know, what we yearn to know, what we are seeking to learn. So you don't have to vocalize that in English. You just project what you are desiring to know and learn, and they respond in that fashion. Okay, so we want to make sure... And uh, the next question, if it doesn't seem like a divinity or ancestral spirit has shown up, what do we do? Now, one of the broadcasts we want you to listen to is Nkombre, Ancestral Shrine, Communication and Liberation. In that broadcast, we go over some of our articles. One of them is called Nsamain Kong and the Seven Senses. And we're talking about the various ways that the Nsamanfo actually communicate with us. And sometimes we don't contextualize those experiences as communication. Sometimes people don't realize, for example, we use the example of the achinebwa, the animal totems that they send, we don't even pay attention. We may not even recognize that we're children, for example, in the Akan tradition. One of the seven metric clans is the Asona Abusia, the Asona clan, and the major animal totem for that clan is the uh, raven or the crow. So they send that animal because it carries the energy of the clan to people who are children of that clan at specific junctures. So you, if you're a child of that particular clan and that, that animal totem, you didn't even recognize it, they very often in specific junctures you see a crow show up and they're bringing a message of warning or confirmation. You were thinking about a thing and you were trying to figure out, is this the right thing that I've settled on? Should I move in this direction? I'm not sure. And then the crow shows up right in front of your car as you're driving or sitting at a red light and so forth confirming for you from them to Mako that this is the thing that they told you to do or they send an animal at specific junctures in your life or you may, you may be a certain kind of cat, um, you may be a child of a um, clan that the lion or the leopard is that clan animal in the Western Hemisphere that feline energy will manifest through certain cats that will show up at specific times or in dreams and so forth. They communicate in that fashion. Sometimes they communicate through other individuals who are wearing certain color clothes and so forth for the same color of the divinity. Different ways that Utsumafa and Abosom communicate with us that we haven't contextualized and didn't realize that all along they were communicating on a regular basis and we didn't see it. So when you look at that Utsumafa and Kom in the seven senses, we go into detail about that information. The other piece is consistency with Susu, consistency with meditation. It's similar to working out. If you went to that health club one day and worked out very hard and then didn't go back for two weeks and you worked out for three days in a row and then go back for four weeks, if you kept that schedule for a year, you would see absolutely no muscle development at all because you weren't consistent. Whereas somebody else could go to the health club six days a week um, for one month and they would see a great deal of muscular development within one month, and you've been going to the same health club for a year, and you have absolutely no development at all. They were consistent and constantly toning themselves, and therefore they were growing and developing. When you engage in Susu Hong meditation on a consistent basis, then you're constantly tuning yourself or attuning yourself, and the more you attune yourself, the more receptive you become because you're constantly entering into that spiritual state on a consistent basis, you become more receptive, and the more receptive you become, the more consistent you are, then those communications become more clear, they become more vivid, your dreams become more clear and vivid and pronounced, your um, interaction with other individuals throughout the course of the day becomes more pronounced because they put you in position to come in contact with people who say things and share with you things that confirm and corroborate corroborate what you learn through Susu, through the meditation. The more consistent you are, the more receptive you become, and you will begin to hear more clearly, and you'll be able to properly contextualize the events that are happening in your life 
we see the marker or the signature that the Simafo and the Abosom have left on those communications to confirm things for you. All right. And and the same thing for that second question. You said, how do we communicate to the ancestors and divinity that we want to know our soul identity and our divine functions? Again, we we'll go into some detail about that in the Nkomre Ancestral Shrine Communication and Liberation broadcast, because in that broadcast, we go through detail, a t detailed examination of those articles that we publish on Ancestral Shrine Communication, how to establish a shrine, basic implements that you put there and so forth, the ritual prayer connects to that. So we go into detail about that, but it's still that same principle of learning directly from them. These are your great grandparents and so forth, great grandmothers, great grandfathers, going back hundreds and forth, as well as thousands of years. Just like you have people come to your house, they sit down, you give them some food, and then you ask them questions. Same thing here. You pour libation, give food offerings and so forth. Spirits come, take up residence, and then you sit down and listen. Tune, engage in susu reflection, measurement, and so forth, and learn and so forth. And then, as you're going throughout the course of everyday life, those confirmations begin to come. And then you can identify, oh, this is exactly what they told me when I was communicating with them. And they will confirm for you if they shared with you identity or showed you images in your head of specific, a specific clan, specific motifs that this clan uses, like they're showing you kente cloth and you know, I think there are symbols and so forth that are icon, specifically icon. They're trying to show you that this is your clan or they're showing you Yoruba sculptures and things like that or directing you and putting you in position to come in contact with Yoruba people on a regular basis, trying to show you that this is your clan. Um, they will send you confirmations as well. And repeated confirmations, not just one time, but uh, repeated confirmations so that you become secure and knowledgeable in exactly who you are. Okay. And we're going to have some a couple calls on the phone line. Okay, the Michi on the phone line, number 5306. You got a question or a comment? Yeah, Michi Mo, brother, question you are, man, for child. Huh. What's up? All right, I was... Uh, is um, asking a question of trying to assume I'm dealing with a lot of people that come and um, into the study group that ask questions about astral projecting uh, when they do meditation or uh, some type of um, a shabia, um I mean, using meditation or susu as a meditation, and they say about astral planning and then also dealing with UFOs and extraterrestrials. I know that, that I mean, myself, I feel as though if it's not going through the um, the, the divinities, then I feel as though that's placing dependency upon some stuff you don't even know, waiting for some little green men to come from out of the sky and talk to you, and I think that's with the whites and the offspring. But I don't know. That's what I'm asking for your insight on that. That's one. And then the other question is about the music, because I asked you before about what music, I mean, what genre of, of sound or rhythm throughout the week can we identify with as far as channeling or invoke, invoking certain divinities? Last question first. That depends on, you know, what kind of music that you're drawn to. There are certain people, of course, like, for example, you have people who are spiritually in tune, they're creative, innovative, and the way that they play jazz music, for example, is different than somebody who's spiritually out of tune. So there's a total difference in the way they, um, you know, craft their composition. And it's actually um, a reflection of their energy complex. So you will feel the energy of, yeah, both of them or the Orisha, like Oshun, coming from somebody who's, you know, really resonating that energy and they put it in their music or another divinity. So um, whether it's that or certain people dealing with uh, hip-hop or R&B and different things, the ones who are in tune with who they are, whether consciously or unconsciously, they will generate those different kinds of genres. 
You have jazz music, you have hip hop, you have R and B, you have fiery energy like some hip hop music, you have cool energy like some jazz music, you have you know, up to music, which is some R and B. You have different energy complexes that manifest through the different expressions of music that we have created and you can align them with different abosom as well. So depending on the kind of the level of consciousness or intuitiveness of the artist, they will project you know, real energy. They will project real pure energy through their innovative expressions of music. Um, so it's what your spirit is drawn to, what your okra, okra is drawn to um, for that. But yeah, it, just with the uh, individuals who are um, the whole UFO extraterrestrial thing, of course that is politically crafted by the whites and their offspring to control the minds of our people. Some of our people like to they reject Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and so forth. The vast majority of our people, they try to lock down with that. They know that some of our people will break away from that. So they try to capture them with pseudo-New Age spirituality or pseudo-metaphysics and so forth, extraterrestrialism, sex cult spirituality, drug addict spirituality, just sexuality, all, all kinds of nonsense. There are no um, physical... Um, you know, UFOs flying around, any physical plane that people see is something that was created by the whites and offspring. It's simply no different than an Air Force plane, a stealth bomber, or anything else. So any physical contraption that anybody sees or has seen is something that's created by the whites and their offspring to perpetuate this foolishness. And then all the little stories that they have about abductions and all that, that only happens to them and all that other nonsense any um, lights and discs and so forth, that's just spiritual energy. Like some of the abosom, they are manifest, you know, their, their aura is radiant. So just like somebody has a radiant and vibrant aura physically and people who are clairvoyant can see the aura. But some people, when they make their transition, if spirit leaves the body, they have a uh, radiant aura or a somewhat radiant aura and it manifests sometimes in the form of a light flash of light, auric looking egg and so forth, that kind of thing. That's just an ancestral spirit, a discarnate spirit. That's all it is. It has nothing to do with the UFO. Sometimes they manifest like that. Sometimes they'll manifest with less uh, illumination so you can see the details, just like a quote-unquote mind, which is the icon term, misnomer ghost. Um, you can see their actual, you know, features and so forth. So, but sometimes white and offspring will try to pass that off, extraterrestrial communication, and then they try to link people to nonsense, like, you know, the Anunnaki and all this other foolishness. That is all nonsense. Now, so what we're dealing with, we're either dealing with the spirits of our direct ancestors and ancestors, the spirits of discarnate relatives, people who are deceased but who are not our relatives, or you're dealing with the forces in nature the deities, the forces that govern nature, as well as the discarnate spirits of, you know, animal life and so forth. You know, a dog that gets killed, the spirit separates from the body, the spirit still exists. So it's either spirits of nature, um, the abosom, or deceased human beings. These are the categories of being that are being dealt with. There are no spirits flying in and out on spaceships coming back and forth. That's nonsense. So um, some people uh, get involved in certain ritual practices no different than they would use drugs. So some people will eat food because they want to fuel themselves. So they'll get, you know, vitamins and minerals or they'll eat certain fruits and vegetables, bananas and things like that so they can have potassium, so they can have their strength, so they can work out, they can do what they need to do. Some people, instead of grabbing a banana from, you know, nature or an apple and things like that, they'll go get a drug or a plant, plant that will have a, you know, narcotic effect upon them because they want to disrupt their brain so that they can have a disrupted experience and call it a high experience because they just want to escape from reality. It's like people do that with food. Some people do that with energy expression. So some people want to engage in Sutsu so they can communicate with their own tribe, communicate with their own ancestors and ancestors, communicate with the Yabosa so they can learn what their functioning creation is, 
become replenished in that power, get proper guidance so they won't make mistakes and create disorder in the world so they can live a harmonious lifestyle. Some people want to try to generate or arouse some energy within themselves just so they can have some, you know, little experience, some little high experience, some little energetic experience. Some people's spirits are kind of light and their spirits do separate from their bodies when they're sleeping. Some people's spirits separate from their bodies when they're engaged in meditation. Some people eat certain foods to make sure their spirit stays grounded in their body because their spirit is so light and they're not very grounded that it just it's hard for them to hold their spirit in their body when they're engaged in meditation or even sometimes sleep. But people who have just engaged in spiritual practice just to have a high or just to, you know, have their spirit leave their body and because it's an adventure, that's no different than somebody, you know, doing drugs just to have a quote-unquote high, just, just to have an energetic experience. But it has, it has no value spiritually at all unless the communication or separation is you're connecting with the non-anormal tomorrow, you're connecting with the abosom or spirit possession is going to take place. If it's, if it's for that reason, then there's a reason for it. But if people are just trying to escape from their body or have an astral separation, so-called astral projection of the spirit just separating because they have a, you know, a light sunsum or a light spirit, they're no different than somebody who's just doing cocaine or something. And most people who are talking about that, you'll notice through their actions and through their behavior, through their speech and through their character that all they're doing is trying to get a spiritual quote-unquote high, and it has no value whatsoever, and they're still in the same self-destructive condition after the quote-unquote actual projecting than they were before they engaged that process. So that's what I would say for that. Well, I say. Okay. So, Made out that we appreciate the call. And by the way, that was the brother Nefriqui, who has a broadcast on Blog Talk Radio Journey and Rhythm on Saturdays. You can check that show out. Um, okay. So, and by the way, there are a few minutes left in the broadcast um, as far as online. It, it, it cuts off at 11.30. If we go beyond 11, 11.30, which we probably won't have to go to beyond 11.30 in the overtime, um, it will cut off online, so only the people who are on the phone line will be able to hear. So if you want to get on the phone line before 11.30, just to make sure that you don't get cut off, uh, the number is 657 3830635657 and we're going to get back to the phone line right quick and before that um for the people who can't stay on um beyond that uh we mentioned the Etchy Sign conference uh coming up March 20th here in Washington DC free conference 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Akurakani Akurakani, the ancestral religious reversion. We'll have a number of presenters. We'll be presenting on the Akan tradition from an ancestrally inherited perspective, of course, ancestral religious reversion. Uh, have a uh, Bodu queen from Louisiana. She'll be talking about the Bodu tradition, born of the blood circles of our people here in North America. Um, a brother talking about the Yoruba tradition in the same vein, as well as another sister dealing with a different aspect of the Yoruba tradition. We'll have a couple more speakers. Keep checking the Etchy Sign page for that information. We also, for those who came in a little bit later, we extended the deadline for those who would like to place an ad in the Etchy Sign journal. Place your business, organization, institution, study group um, in the journal. We'll be publishing that journal and releasing it and giving it away for free, to that book for free to everyone who comes to the conference. We've had over a million, nearly a million and a half, it's on our website over the past 12 months, so if you place your ad in the journal, it will reach a number of people. Because we will not only give it away to the people who come to the conference, but the ebook version of the journal will be online on our website for free. And then the soft cover version we will sell uh, after the conference is over. So when people order our books, that will be another option that they can order. And, of course, those people will see your ad for your business organization or institution as well. Originally, the deadline was this past Miminidas Saturday, February 13th, to get those ads in. For some people, um, it didn't fit in with their pay schedule. Some people get paid on the 15th and the last day of the month, and some people uh, next Friday. So we extended that deadline 
to this weekend. So get those JPEG files in if you would like to play some ads. A one quarter page ad is $25, a half page ad is $35, a full page is $50, and of course it's in full color. And it's an eight and a half by 11 full magazine size book. So um, you can get those ads in. All of the information is on our Etsy sign page for that. And also we also extended for the same reason, we extended our sale for our book. So we have that 1791, the 17 books for $91. All 17 of our books for $91. Um, and that extends to this weekend as well. Of course, we did the broadcast on 1791, the 1791 Mina Rebellion that took place in Louisiana. Our people conspiring, getting together to rebel against enslavement in 1791. So we had that 1791 of 17 books for $91 in recognition of that event. Um, so that sale extends. So you can go to, you see the website. On our publications page, you will see that we have a special button uh, for that specific sale, 17 books for $91, automatic, so you can make that order. And may I say, we thank you to the people who have ordered, you know, contributed to that sale. That, that was a fundraiser because we need to cover some of the expenses, contribute to some of the travel expenses of a couple of our presenters who will be coming from out of state at the Etchy Sign Conference here in D.C. on March 20th, and, of course, they're coming for free and they're presenting, and, of course, the entire conference is free, but we would like to help contribute, you know, for their travel expense, and this is a fundraiser to help with that, as well as to help with the publication of the free books. We want to give, give out a, at least 100 books for everybody who comes through, and we did the same thing in October when we had our Who Do Mind Who Do Nation Festival. We published our Who Do Mind book articles on who do and so forth, um, gave away a free copy to everyone who came to the event. And over the past, uh, over a year and a half, we've given away over 800 copies, free copies of our soft cover book. And the way we are able to do that to every city that we've gone to, we've gone to a number of cities, number of states and so forth. And every time we go out, we, the uh, presentations are always free. We do not charge people to come to our presentation. They are always free. And we give away a free copy of a book to everyone who comes to the presentation. So they come to a free presentation and they leave with a free copy of one of our books. And the reason we've been able to do that is because of the support from the community. So when you, whenever you purchase a book, one or more books, or make a donation, we can give you books in return for your donation. That allows us not only to print out the books to ship to you, but also to set aside one or more books. And over time, we can collect some. And then when we do a presentation, we can give them out for free so we can have this truthful information circulating through, through the community. Of course, there's a great deal of misinformation circulating through the community by, of course, the whites in our spring, as well as individuals who, you know, pretend as though they're culturally grounded and they're misinforming people on a daily basis. Okay. So we're going to take another call um, on the phone line. Okay, Michelle on the phone line, uh, number 4266. Six. You had a question or a comment? Uh, greetings, Baba. My name is Christine. I uh, I wanted to ask, uh, will consistently, will, if I practice meditation on a consistent basis, will that help to, um, will that help to, for me to retain my dreams? I don't dream, well, I know that everyone dreams. And I don't oftentimes remember or I don't have the ability to re re retain my dreams so that I, you know, can I can receive messages or images that I may be get, getting, um, you know, from the ancestral realm or from um, from the deities or whatever. So I wanted to know if I was to be consistent with meditation or meditation practices, would that assist me in developing the ability to retain my dreams so that I can remember them. Very often it does. Um, very often dreams start to become more vivid, the more consistent people are with it. Um, and, and we want to note that when we're talking about Susu Ho meditation, it is in the context of ritual practice, as opposed to like some people who teach meditation, like, oh, you just go sit in a quiet room and, 
you know, meditate on the abyss and meditate on your breath or focus on your breath and things like that. Our susu has always been in the context of ritual practice. We're meditating to focus our observation on the ka, the ka, the soul, the mind, consciousness, or the abosom that govern us, or our ancestresses and ancestors. It's always a focused observation. Um, so, but we're just pulling it out right now just to show that this is part of our practice. <clears throat> it's always been a part of our practice, but it's not disconnected from overall ritual practice. But very often, it does, with consistency, the dreams become more vivid and easier to retain or to recall them at specific moments, at specific junctions. So you may not wake up and remember them, but when you're in the midst of a situation, then it comes and floods your consciousness that, oh, this is what I dreamed about, and this is exactly what they were trying to communicate with me. Now, on the other hand, some people, um, the abosom, utilize dreams more so than other people to communicate. Some people, they utilize um, Achinebwa animal totems more frequently and more prominently to communicate their messages, where other people, they use dreams more prominently to communicate their messages, whereas other people, there are different ways. So everybody's not going to have the same intensity with regard to um, the dream state and so forth, because some people, that's not the major means by which the Nsamaf and Abosom communicate with them. But typically, okay. when you engage Susan Hall on a regular basis, they become more vivid, they become more constant, and you will be able to retain them. Um, or at the least, even if, if, if you're not the kind of person where that's the major way they communicate with you, when it's time for you to, uh, you know, learn from a specific dream or, or communication that came through a dream, it will flood your consciousness at the right moment. Like when you're in the midst of a situation or you're about to go into a situation, that's when okay. that dream will come back to you and show you this is the dream that was addressing this situation. Okay, so there'll be a certain type of uh, synchronicity, not all uh, being able to connect certain events that occur throughout, uh, you know, everyday, day-to-day living, and 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 maybe dreams too. That you, it will be uh, synchronicity will become more obvious. Would that be Would that be accurate to say? Definitely, exactly. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you. Okay, made out there. We appreciate that. And it looks like we have, let me see, we have a couple more minutes, so we can fit one more call in before the end of the broadcast. We have a number of calls, so if we, we're not, it looks like we're not going to be able to get to everybody because we have a, quite a few. Um, so if you have a question and we weren't able to get to you, just send us an email. We get a number of emails, but we, we you know, we get through them as soon as we can. Uh, but email us either on Facebook or on our regular email address on the website. So, um, if you have on the phone line number 9384, you have a question or a comment? Michiawo, Nana Kwesi. Okay, um, my question is, I've been meditating for some years. Um, it's gotten very, you know, complex at times. I often, I actually teach meditation during the warm season. Um, so when I'm trying to figure out whether or not that if sometimes what I experience is, uh, is it actually controllable and which means, okay, like you were saying, we, the, you, you're saying that the purpose of meditating is basically, um, communicating, you know, with the Asamando, um, communicating with our Ka and whatnot. So what happens when, on a consistent basis, like I, uh, I see uh, future events, and sometimes they're frivolous. Like, to me, you know, they have absolutely no meaning. It's like, okay, why did I see that later on that day I may, some, uh, it may occur, and I'm wondering why. What was the purpose? You know, is, is that something wrong? Is there something wrong with that? Is, it, is there something in me that I'm not controlling? Well, now, if you, if you, why are you, why would you characterize it as frivolous? Because it's, I, I don't know the meaning of it. Like, okay, anytime I engage in meditation, uh, I, I do so with focused intent, as you were saying. Um, 
like I know why I, I, I sit down and meditate every time. And so when I see something, it's just like, for instance, I may hear someone say, okay, in meditation I may hear a particular word, you know, just some term. And, you know, later on that day, you know, I may have plans to be, you know, with a particular person, but I know from that meditation that person is going to say that word. I know that. And then when I get with that person, they'll say that word. And then it'll just be like, okay, what was the point of that? Because okay. it may not have necessarily anything to do with anything that's going on, nor my function. So I think. But what is what is the point of consistently having these type of uh, experiences where you foresee things? Well, now, one thing, now, it, it wouldn't be frivolous if you think about it. Number one is showing you, because the first part of your question was something being controllable, and then you kind of, looked at this as, well, you're not really controlling it, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's pointing to the fact that certain things are controlled (laughs) because it's showing you you have the capacity to attune to other individuals. So it's very similar to uh, the Utamapo, their vantage point, for example, we would say it's similar to somebody standing on top of a building. They can see one car is speeding toward an intersection, another car is speeding toward an intersection. They can see what's about to take place because they have a different vantage point. They can see things unfolding and developing. And in a similar sense, you're attuning to someone's spirit. Before they even say a word, it's already crafted within their spirit. It's like if you try to remember somebody's name and it's on the tip of your tongue, you can't remember it, but you know what the name is because it's in your spirit. You just can't form the words in your physical mouth to say it, but it's already in you. Or before you're about to engage in something or tell somebody something, you already have the desire to be wrap physical words around the desire and the imagery because it manifests spiritually. So you're attuning to people's spirit before they even say what they said, showing that you have some control, some measure of control to attune to other individuals. And because you have some measure of control or receptivity to attune to other individuals, that also points to the fact that you have to learn how to take control of that capacity to attune to other individuals. So you can utilize that to its best, you know, extent. So it won't be, you won't be attuning to the wrong individuals or people who are engaged in this or just people who are just kind of not engaged in anything who would kind of be wasting time if you have the capacity to attune to what people are what track people are on and they're on a specific track so it's gonna to lead to them doing engaging in certain behaviors and saying certain things and you can attune to that track before you even come in contact with them and then you get in contact with them and they you know repeat what what track they're on. If you have that capacity then it shows that you can utilize that skill in other areas. It also shows you have to develop that skill and make it focus towards you know, supporting your encrobia, every intention, every action, every thought. So it's, wow. it, it shows that it's controllable. It also shows, you know, what capacity you have. But it, it talks about that. Like we talked about number four in the uh, seven principal values of assedia, responsibility, school focus, meditation, observation. But number five was tree, which means to refine refine the spiritual capacities that you learned about. So through meditation, you learn about these capacities. But then you must engage the process of refining your spiritual potencies and your talents and so forth so that you can build, so that you can utilize them to build and do what you need to do. But first you must learn that you have them, that you have that capacity. You're learning that you have that capacity or you know you have that capacity. Then the next piece is to refine them so it's targeted, you know, like a surgical strike. You only utilize that capacity to do exactly what you need to do and and so forth. Every now and then you may come in contact with somebody and it may seem frivolous on the outside, but the reason why you're drawn to them is not just because you tuned into them, but because they are trying to tune in to you or somebody like you. They're reaching out to try to find out about their ancestral culture and they're drawn to whoever is on that same frequency and you are on the frequency. So they may appear to be somebody who's just, you know, it's a waste of time and maybe frivolous, but they've been yearning. They don't even know consciously. They've been trying to attune to their own cop, their kaya, trying to figure out 
I need to be doing something different. Something is missing. I don't know what it is. Maybe I should not be in church or something like that. But they don't really know. But they're drawing you to them. So it may develop in that way as well. Okay. Okay. Meta Ase. Okay. Yeni Ase. We appreciate the call. Okay. So we, um, all right. So it's after 1130 now. So we're going to end it here. If you have any questions or comments, just hit us up on the email um, for those questions or comments, whether it's the email on our regular website or on uh, Facebook. Um, we are Quasi Akan on Facebook or Ojirafo on Facebook. Um, remember also, we are also on Instagram as Ojirafo, uh, YouTube as OGFO, Google Plus, OGFO, and of course you can follow us on this broadcast channel as well. You can click the follow button. That way anytime we send out the mass email to give updates about the events that are going on in the broadcast, you'll automatically be on that list. And of course you can also join our Akuraka dash com social media network we talked about earlier. Um, we have our own separate social media network separate from Facebook, where people who are sending the same kind of information here as well as around the world are people only, of course, um, connect. And, you know, people have blogs, people post videos, post uh, events, post discussion, post, you know, different things. So you can join that as well. So, again, um, Yeda say we thank you for individuals who have been supporting the work. Remember, you can take advantage of that 17 books for $91. We extended the deadline for this week only. So you can go to the page and check that out. Or you, if you want to just buy one or more of our books, they range between 8 and $11, regular retail price. You can check those out on the Unhoma page on our website. Um, and again, Yedase, we thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. Okay.